I'm Gripton. I'm going to walk you through the basics, understandings of the software, what you need to do in creating um, vibrant designs for your rhinestone machine <clears throat> or for your uh, or for your spangle machine. Now I'm, I'm expecting everybody can hear my voice, and if anybody cannot, you'll probably want to chime in on the chat and let um, let the uh, organizer know, and we'll get that worked out for you. Now the first couple questions I want the first question I did get um, o over the years is when they install the software my my computer just crashes and freezes up. It's important because the software actually uses three dimensional graphics for for rendering rhinestones. And I'll turn on the 3D here. When you look at that stone, you can see that it looks like a stone. That's three dimensional graphics. So the software that you must have it, or the computer must have should have the capabilities of rendering that quickly. A couple things you want to keep in mind is um, you want to actually, if you have Windows 7 or Windows 8, you can just go to uh, uh, go to your all programs, and you want to find this folder called accessories. Now, if you don't have Windows 7, you're working Windows 8 or 8.1. What you want to do is you want to go to your main desktop and actually click on the magnifying glass and type in system information. Now I'll click on system, I'll cl click on accessories and I'll go to system tools and you want to go to system information here. Now system information is going to give us a couple things here. Number one is going to tell us the processing speed that our computer is working at. Processors are actually the via, uh, are the components in your computer that actually process data. The faster uh, the processor, the better it is for any software. For instance, in my uh, computer here, I have an Intel Core i7. And it's a processor speed of 2.7. They recommend 2.8 or 3.2 or 3.4 or higher. The higher, the better. Okay, it's going to write data faster. The second most important feature is your installed physical memory. As you can see on, on here, I have 16 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, they recommend 8 gigabytes or higher. I go to 16 because I'm tr I want to make sure that this computer is not obsolete as I add other softwares to it through the years. The next thing you want to do is in the components feature, you want to go to display, and the display card that you should have, it, it should be an NVIDIA GeForce card, and you can see I have a, a GT 650M NVIDIA, and I have two gigabytes of RAM there. Now, what that is going to allow me to do, it's going to allow me to operate more, much faster uh, speed on my computer because I'm using my display card or my video card to render my the graphics, it has its own memory. If you if your system actually says Intel high definition graphics, then you have no graphics card, and you are going to be reliant on the how much RAM you have in your computer. If this is very small, then you will crash and you will have freeze ups as the data tries to write the data, write what you have done and what you want to try to say. So we we could tender uh, questions later later about that. The theory of the design, there's four steps that you have to do every single time when creating a design. If you master those four steps, okay, then it makes the learning curve a lot easier. The first step we need is we need an image. We, and the way we do that, once we open up the software, we have uh, several tabs here. We have the artwork tab in which we can actually pull images in, either images that are saved to our computer, if we have a scanner connected to our computer, it does have the scanner twain devices where you can actually scan an image right into the software. You don't have to go through the scanner software to do it. You could also do paste bitmap, which is more of a screen capture. And that's in the raster section. You have vector section here, which allows me to open up a vector file. Now, the difference between vector files and, and rasterized images is very simple. I'm going to go to images here, and I'm going to bring in a graphic here. And as you can see, this JPEG, this is a JPEG, and you can see how low resolution the image is. My oranges are not pure oranges, and even in the outer edges of the black, we can see some tones of gray. That's a low resolution image. This has low memory uh, necessities. But if I go to the vector images, and I'll just go to my folder where they're at, and uh, go to public, and we'll go to pictures. ERA images and we'll go to vector. All vector images will be clean. Color is pure color. When I when I look at that black, it's pure black from edge to edge. It's 
Also, too, what Vectors allows me to do is allows me to ungroup an image and pull it apart piece by piece. So I can delete certain sections from this design. All the way down to the horse. Now I just got the horse. Get rid of the outline. I cannot do that with JPEGs, okay? I cannot, I cannot ungroup that. There are, there are no group, group, uh, ungrouping features. You do have the, uh, the ability to convert graphics to, to vectors, so you can ungroup them and pull things out, and I'll show you how to do that later on. Once we have our image, we need to edit our image. Now, editing our image is actually just doing different editing to it. For instance, this horse, the customer requires it to be six and a half inches wide. So if I click on the image and I go to the layout tab up top here, here's my image, uh, my sizing specs right here. If I need this to be six and a half inches wide, I just simply type in 6.5 and enter. And you see it does resize proportionally. You do have the capabilities of, of resizing uh, out of proportion by simply turning off, let me click on it again, turning off this lock here. When I turn that off, I can set the size independent of the width. Once we've edited our graphic, which was step two, the next thing we must do is actually convert our graphics to rhinestones. And to do that, I will go to the Hotfix tab right over here. When I go to the Hotfix tab, it opens up the beads that I have set in my bead bar or my palette, my color palette. If I want to do this image in black, what I would do is click on the Open Hotfix Catalog tab, and I'll sweep out the beads that are in my bead bar, and I will choose the size. We'll go to 2 millimeter, which is your SS6 sizes. Choose the color, and add it to my bead bar. Once I hit Accept, you can see now the color has been added to my bead bar. The last step of this, uh, of uh, step number uh, four is actually, uh, step number three is converting the image to, to the rhinestone. So if I click on my image, up here, since I have a vector, it says convert to embroidery, uh, convert to hotfix. So I just simply choose that, and I choose the type of fill that I want. For instance, I want to fill this with rhinestones. I will click uniform fill area, and just like that, we have our rhinestones. I'll turn off my vector, and now you can see it. It's that simple. Now, if I want to border this, I can border that easily. I'm going to go ahead and go to my bead bar, and I'm going to add another 2 millimeter, and we'll do red. Simply click on the red color, click where you want to appropriate the red, and then add the border by clicking border, and just simply turn on the border. And there we go. If you don't want the border, you just click on it and you turn the border off by simply clicking this button right here. Now, the nice thing about this software is we can see down here in the bottom left, we have 2,387 stones. If I resize this image, the stones that are required to fill this object will be added automatically. Now you can see we have 6,710 stones. If I shrink the image down to something more of a youth size, the stones are deleted. Now I only have 1,564 stones. That's an added benefit so you don't have to create the design twice. Let's go ahead and resize it back out. Let's change the stone sizes to SS10s, okay? So I just simply click on it. I'll go to the stone that is there and I'll just add a bead. In the B bar here, in the Hotfix Selector tool, I will choose the SS10 stones, select the color that I want to add, and then click Add. Now you can see the stone is sitting right there. Hey, All Alan, I do is... Alan, I've got a, I've got a kind of a, a, a setup question here for you. Mm -hmm. Somebody noticed that when you were, um, when you're in the last screen, and if you look up at the top of your existing screen, that it said Stitch Era, and they're asking mm -hmm. the difference between Stitch Era and Hotfix Era. In Stitch Era, what, the embroidery section here? Yes. Well, it, Sierra has actually been widely known as an as a embroidery software digi for digitizing purpose for, for embroidery machines. They've actually, about four years ago, started, or three and a half years ago, started to break through in creating rhinestone, uh, a rhinestone application to their already existing embroidery software. So just as easily 
as I was able to convert that horse uh, to rhinestones, I could also convert it to embroidery. This is an option that you can do. I could choose the type of stitch. The stitches will be populated automatically, just like that. And then we take a look at that. We just change my stitch direction. And there we go. So now we've, now we've converted to stitches. Now let's go ahead and border this with rhinestones. You could take it a step further with the, with the, uh, with the Liberty add-on. If right. I now, click now on let it... Let me just be clear to everybody that's yep. listening. This is, if you guys are using a CAMS or a Pro Spangle, all you have right now is Hotfix Era. If you have an embroidery machine as well, if it's a commercial machine, then you can upgrade to get the Stitch Era as well. Um, I've got another, another question here while I get back to the Hotfix side, Alan, and that's... Um, yep. What format was that um, vector graphic in? Was that a PSD file? It was a WMF. If I go in here and I write, and, and if I go to uh, the, well, I'll go to the folder. It's a WMF, a Windows Meta file. Okay. All these, all these files in here that Sierra gives to you to practice with are WMFs. So if you have Corel Draw and you have an image uh, that's an EPS, you can actually resave it as a WMF and it becomes totally import, uh, importable into the Sierra software. Okay. Okay. Let's go ahead and uh, let's let's deal with another vector now. We're going to open up this heart, and I'll show you the different functions of the, of of how we can actually fill with rhinestones. Uh, I'm going to ungroup my object because this is a vector, and I'm going to go to hotfix. I'm going to choose the red stones, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the top section of this heart, and I'm going to convert it to hotfix. And the first one is you're going to be familiar with. This is a radial fill. It's just kind of fills the, the heart with stones just like that. The other fill pattern you get is called, let me just click on it and I'll convert, is going to be ring fill. Now ring fill will do this type of design here where it just does rings in the fill instead. This number up here represents the spacing of the beads. The lower the number, the beads get closer together. If I go to three, you can see they get really close. If I go to 56, they get further apart and actually radiate out. So you can have some fun with that. Another fill pattern we got is called this flexible fill. Now what the flexible fill does, it kind of fills in my stones. I'm just going to pull these out so we can see. It kind of lets you decide how to fill this, this object. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust my bead space into about four. I'm going to adjust my bead line. See, you got lines of beads here. I'm going to increase it to about 15. And what I want to do is I want to make this look like a sawtooth or like a jagged, uh, jagged fill. You have a tool up here called Stitch Direction. And if I just go ahead and do some zigzags lines right through here, I'm actually putting commands into software to force my stones to take this type of fill pattern. And there we go, just like that. Of course, you can actually do other fills like uh, you could do uh, spiral. Uh, let me click on it again. All right, and we'll go to stitch direction, and then we'll just do like a wavy line through it. And you can see what it does. This actually, this gives you a lot more um, That's uh, cool. functions of actually how and how to fill an object. Of course, you can act, you can actually edit it even further by clicking on it in these yellow lines if you just move them it actually changes the fill pattern. I'm going to go to rasterize images and I'm going to actually bring in this New York uh, Knicks um, uh, logo here. And the first thing I want to do, this is how I handle JPEGs, okay? So I'm going to go to layout and I'll go to uh, maybe a seven inch file. All right, so now if you look closely at the image, you can see there's a lot of different colors in that orange. So the first thing we want to do is reduce our colors, okay? We don't want a, a, a high mixture of colors. You can see how there's little tones there are actually going to mess up the, the, uh, the file. Um, the way that you would convert a JPEG is, uh, I'll just show you what, what the problems are going to be, is I have a magic wand under the autocomplete, and if I click on it, see how jagged the selection is? And that's because around that color I selected are other colors, and it won't select those. And you can see that throughout my artwork. So what we want to do initially is actually reduce the colors. If I click on the artwork, you see color reduction show up here under the image tab. 
and it opens up automatically. I'm going to tell it to look for up to 32 colors, and you can see all the colors that it sees in this image. There's not just one orange, one blue, one black, one gray. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reduce this color to, to five colors because I do have a white background. I hit filter. It will reduce all the colors to the five primary colors like I did there, and I hit return. And now when we zoom in, we can see that all the colors are clean. Now I can convert this image to rhinestones. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Hotfix. I'm going to go, this is step number uh, three. I'm going to add the beads that I need. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is I'm going to add two millimeters for the black inside. And maybe I want to go to rhine studs. Down at the bottom of this list are my rhine studs. So I'm going to go to black. There it is. And Alan, you would use uh, studs if you're working with the Pro Spangle, correct? Well, I mean, most people will buy studs instead of rhinestones because black is black. So right. it's cheaper to actually create your designs in rhine studs. It's cheaper by uh, by a long shot than in rhinestones. It just it's a it's a primary color. Um, you got to use clear stones. You got to use red stones. But you know, if you're if you're uh, you know trying to profit as much as you can off your rhinestone work, then rhine studs makes the makes makes the difference. And, and I, I always I just also want to point out that that even though you're choosing these stones. Uh, here, it's for display purposes only, so you can see what the artwork is going to look like. It has no bearing on what the, the machine actually outputs. That's right. So now I'm going to choose a 2.8, which is my SS10 size, okay? And we, we're going to use uh, orange or sun. I'm going to add that to my B bar. We're also going to add sapphire, which is going to be my blue ring. And we're going to add clear uh, SS16, which are going to be my 3.8s. And I'll find a clear stone and add it to my bead bar so you can see there's all my beads I intend to use. All right, so the first thing I want to do is how I, how I convert the colors. It's simple. My image is still a JPEG. I can't ungroup it. Instead, what I do have, I'll go to Hotfix. I'll choose the color I intend to work with first, which is going to be the, uh, let's go ahead and go with the orange first. And I'll choose the fill pattern I intend to use. And you have this autocomplete feature here, which gives you a magic wand. And when I click, you can see the selection of my artwork is more precise. All you got to do is hit the Enter button, and there's my stones. I'll now click on the blue. And I'll deselect, and I'll click on the blue. And I'll choose Path. And what I want to do is I want to convert this blue uh, outline to uh, rhinestone. So I'm going to click on it. And it's going to give me two path lines, one on the inside and one on the outside. So you'll see that in a second. I'm going to hit Enter. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete the outside one. Okay. And let's see. What I'm going to actually, let's go ahead and do, let's do a fill instead. Okay. Let's go ahead and click off that. Click on uh, Hotfix. And we'll choose a fill. That looks a lot better. Okay. You might want to be, you can see like if I turn the image off, you can see that the stones are kind of like cluttering up over here. Don't worry about the overlaps, we'll take care of that in a second. But what I'll do is I'll just increase the bead space until it straightens out, just like that. There we go. And now we'll turn back our image, and we'll click on the clear stones. And what I'll do is I'll click on the fill, and I'll click on the gray section and hit enter. And there's my SS14, uh, SS16 uh, stones. So now all we got to do is the black. I always work from the larger stones to the detail, which is the black in the letter. And I want the black to be on top. So I'm going to click on the black stones, click on the fill, and I'll hit Enter, Enter, and click, and then Enter. Hey, Alan, let me stop you for a sec and ask you to go back a, a step. Um, how did you increase the bead spacing again? The bead spacing is actually controlled. Once I select the bead area, like this orange. Yeah. Up here, there's two tools here. You have bead spacing. By increasing the number, the beads get further apart. By decreasing the number, they get closer together. And that goes for the for the border as well as the fills, right? That's correct. That's correct. The other thing you do, the other tool you have here is the margin tool, which is the the number underneath of it. As you can see, my rhinestones. Uh, when I when I drew these two paths, the blue against the orange. The center of the blue is half on the blue and half on the orange, okay? Because that's where the center line is lined up. Well, if I want to keep the orange inside, I would just increase margin. 
by increasing the margin, the orange starts to come into the orange section and away from the other colors of the design. There we go. By doing 12, that looks pretty clean. I'll also do the blue that way, too. I'll go to 12. Yeah. There we go. And you can see what happens is as you increase the stone, the two lines of stones get closer, to cl get closer and closer. What's the, we'll what's, the, the Alan, what's the minimum kind of distance that you would put for spacing on a cans? On a cans machine, I would do like, it depends on the stone size. Like on SS-16s, uh, what I would do is actually, uh, and you could probably do like an 8. And if I change my background color to black so we could see what, what I'm doing here, you'll see that the distance is actually pretty good there. Uh, what I'm going to do is actually going to take my distance. You know, you know, and on smaller stones, stones, you go lower to like what, a 3? Yeah, on the SS-10 stones, I'll go to like uh, 5 or 4. It all depends. See, it all, if I go to, I can go all the way down to 3, but oftentimes you'll start to see jumbling of stones where the fill doesn't look consistent. Yeah. By increasing the bead spacing, I get a lot better spacing and thus a, a lot better look to my design. And you spend less on stones. Now, now Pro Spangle is a little bit more precise, right? That's right. That's correct. That's I can go real close and be the reason will be in is because SS, uh, glass cut stones, SSI stones, are actually not the same consistency and diameter from stone to stone. It's impossible to achieve that, and that's basically due to the soft nature of glass during the pro polishing of the stones during the creation. You'll have stones that are 1.9 millimeter on an SS6, and you'll have some stones that are going to be 1.7. So keeping stones real close together, they oftentimes are going to conflict with each other or hit the, the, the previously set stone or the larger stone that's in the line. Mm -hmm. And that will keep you, that will make your stone sit up on their side. When you deal with um, impact type machines like the Spangle machine where you're cutting an exact diam diameter, uh, you'll actually get more precise placement. And you can go close as close as you want to on those placements. And even rind studs are the same thing. Rind studs are actually extruded aluminum, and they are actually punched out just like a spangle, just in a, a, a much larger uh, way. Gotcha. Hey, Alan, another, another question. If you don't like the, um, the way that orange is filled, for example, can you change the directionality or? Well, what I would do here is actually I would actually edit the graphic here. See, what I do is, you see, here's my outline file of the orange. And if I just move this line up, just move the nodes up. See, I, I edit on the nodes. Okay, the nodes are actually management tools for shape. Every time I move a node, it changes the whole shape. So I would do this, and I would do this side as well. But you could you could apply could you apply one of the like um, one of the other fill patterns to that area as well? Yes, I could if it works. Uh, this is being uh, this being a circular design. The radial fill pattern obviously will work better because there's a lot of radiuses with this design. But you could um, do like a zigzag, just like you did with the heart or something along. Yeah, well, well, you you have two fill patterns with this selection. This is called a, a radio. Uh, uh, this one actually is called the uh, area with hot fix uniform fill. Uh, the two the two options you have is this radial type fill, and you have this hexagon fill as well. When I do that, you can see I get a lot better fill there where I got a staggered placement of stones. You see, a hexagon fill puts two stones and one stone, two stones and one stone in between. So you get a lot better fill. Because I'm using hexagon, I also have the ability to increase my margin a lot and still get a nice looking design. See, that still looks filled. And I'm using less stones. See, that's 1,013. When I was on radial fill and I was at a value of 14, I'm now at 1,052, and over the course of several rhinestone transfers, that could, that could add up to some savings. Okay? Uh, but most of the time what I'm doing is I'm editing on the node right here. See, I'm just, if you move the node, it actually changes the fill object. Now, the last part of this design, of course, is the, is the, uh, is the text, so I'll turn my image back on, choose the stone I intend to use, choose the fill pattern of my choice, and then just oop, and then just set it. Just uh, click on the letter where it goes and hit enter. And there we go. So now what now what we can do is actually we can actually bring this margin out just a little bit more. It's going to go to twenty. And when I do that, I see how these stones got closer together and further away from the black. 
There we go. And that's not too bad for a JPEG. Why don't, why don't you lighten up the background? Uh, of course, the further you go now. Can't really see the black. There we go. Now, just for this, is you know, for for the rest of it, I would just edit. I would just move the nodes in and just and just and clean up these areas right here. Gotcha. But that's how I that's how I would step through. We'll we'll just do we'll do one more pro we'll do one more project for you, uh, and then we'll go on to text. Okay. So when I, I'm going to go to images and I'm just going to go to my uh, desktop. And let's see, I have clip art in here. Where is it at? Desktop. There it is, clip art. And I have bad clip art here. And anyway, since we're getting real close to uh, to St. Patty's Day, you can see how bad this clip art image is here. This is a very bad resolution image that you that I just got from a uh, from a catalog. And what I could do is actually just clean up that image. I'm just going to step through it real quick. We have three colors. We have a white background, green, and black. I'll go to color reduction, reduce reduce my colors to three, and there it is. Hit return. Now that I cleaned up my image, now I can go ahead and convert to rhinestone. So let's just go ahead and go to hotfix. Since it's a small design, I'm going to go ahead and go with an SS6 stone. Grab my emerald, and I'm going to see if uh, this can add a black to it as well. And now all I'll do is I'll go to uh, the fill, click on the green. It's all selected. Hit enter. There they are. And let's go ahead and resize this a little bit. It's a little small. Get a little bit better fill. There we go. Let me turn off my image now. And that looks pretty good. I'm just going to adjust my bead spacing, maybe go to six on this. I'm using less stones. And there we go. If I want to add that border. Huh? That looks great. I'm going to add the border. I'm not sure if the border is going to work because it's going to take the place. See, the border actually takes the place of a color. So I think it's going to just replace all the green with black. So if I just click on my image and I go to border. Hey, uh, while that updates, what what version of the software do you have, Alex? Alan? I have I have eleven point four one. The version is seen right in the in the home screen right here. Okay. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and deal with text. Let's make an image from start to finish. Let's go ahead and delete this guy. It's going to bring a basic four leaf clover in here. We're going to size it out. I want this to be uh, let's go five and a half inches tall. Right, you can see how dirty it is, okay? And you'll notice because when I go and, and magic wand this thing, it's not going to see, it's actually not too bad, but you can see how bad it, on the edges it is. So I'm going to go ahead and go to color reduction. I only have two colors in this design, green and white background. And now we can go to hotfix and then convert. Just like that. Very simple to do. Now let's go ahead and do some text with this, okay? I'm actually going to put a, uh, we're actually going to do another. Um, we're actually going to do. Uh, let's go to artwork, and I'll just put the letter uh, C in there. Now, this were the, the these fonts are actually being pulled um, from my uh, Windows library of fonts, and I could choose any one of these fonts. Let's go ahead and choose this one. It looks pretty cool, and I'm just going to bold it. And what I want to do is I'm just going to size it a little bit better. Now you have some Alan, advanced while, while you do that, I just want to I just want to remind everybody that just because you have a true type font on your computer doesn't mean it's going to convert into rhinestones really well. Yeah, it all depends on the font. You simple simple fonts is a lot uh, means a lot. Now my intention in this design is have the four leaf clover, but have the shirt color as the letter C. And in order to do that, I'm going to have to cut that C out of that four leaf clover. To do that, you select both objects and. Let's, let's click on both objects. There we go. There's that one, and there's the. Let's do that again. 
I need a vector. I'm going to convert this to a vector. There we go. Okay, so now that I have a vector, a vector file here, we're going to send it to the back. So we see our C. You select both objects, and you have this tool called Combine Vectors. And in it, I will choose Simplify. What that's going to do is going to cut that C out of that four-leaf clover. I just delete the C and then convert the four-leaf clover to my rhinestones. You see, that looks pretty good. Okay, we can do that in any color. Just choose the color you want. There we go. Now, if you wanted the C to be filled, let's go and go back to the image. And I'll click on the C first, and I'll convert that to hotfix. Turn off the hotfix, and we'll choose the black. We'll choose the C and convert that to hotfix. I'll go to uh, uh, the hexagon fill. Let's take a look at our image. There we go. So the last step is what we want to do is we want to delete all these overlap stones, okay? And that they're called conflicts. And that's just a finishing the design. You just click on the conflicts tab and just sweep them right out of there. They're gone, and now we have our completed design. We could even border the uh, the four-leaf clover and go a little bit further. Cleaned up the file a little bit. Whenever you edit your design, always do your conflicts, and there we go. Hey, Alan, just just pause for a second. I want to kind of catch up with everybody because um, that was important. You brought in a regular JPEG, you cleaned it up, mm -hmm. converted it to a vector, and did the cutout. Is there any mm -hmm. part of that process that you guys didn't get out there? We'll do it again. We'll do it again. We'll, we'll go ahead and do it again. I'm going to bring in that 40 clover. And that's a JPEG. Gonna, the, yeah, this is a JPEG. Uh, this is actually a, a PNG file. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Layout. I set the size. Okay. I'll zoom out a little bit. And now what I'll do is I'm going to convert this to a vector, okay? To do it cleanly, I'm going to first reduce my colors because inside there are multiple colors here. So I'll go ahead and reduce my colors to the only colors I see is white and white background and the green. And then I click on return. It's now reduced. That'll help me convert to a vector cleanly. If I tell this software to search for up to 256 colors, it still only sees two. The transparent option here is telling me what layer am I considering to be the transparent layer. All Any transparent layer will be deleted from the vector, okay? So for instance, if I, it sees the green, if I choose green as my transparent, it'll leave the white background and delete the green. Since I don't need the white layer, I'll okay, vectorize and the white layer is removed, okay? Uh, the only time I would choose no transparent is if there's white image in my design, like if I was doing a uh, something red, white, and blue, or a flag, or something like that. I would want to maintain the white information in the image, and I would delete the background color just simply by clicking on it and hitting delete. Once you hit return, your image is now a vector, okay? I can actually do several different things. If I want a three-dimensional look to this thing, I can control C and control V, which is universally con uh, your uh, copy and paste, and I'll just do a drop shadow effect here, and we'll make this one darker. So this is a pretty cool tool, uh, tool you can use, okay? And what I'll do is I'll highlight both layers, and we want to combine these. I want to cut the overlaps. So you can see the section and dotted lines that are overlapping that I cannot use. I'll use Simplify, and now what I have is this three-dimensional four-leaf clover that I could highlight. And because I have a vector, I can now choose Convert to the Hotfix. And there it is. So now we want to do. And now you can see what I'm going to do is just I'm going to select all these. And over on the right hand sidebar, I have this object manager. And I'm not sure if you can see it. Let's move my image over. What it does, it tells me the colors. This I can actually choose the color of the stone and the size based upon what I have in my bead bar, the bead spacing, the type of fill. We're going to go hexagon on that. And now we'll take a look at it. We have a much better fill. Of course, this image is too small to actually show with a decent 3D, so the larger the image, the better. So that's one technique you can use with, with vectors. Uh, I have a lot of fun with that, especially with text. All right, so we'll turn back on our image. We'll get rid of the three-dimensional the three thing. 
All right, there we go. So now we're back to our one image. So what we want to do is we want to just uh, convert this to rhinestone. So click on it, convert to hotfix. And of course, I want to use green. There we go. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off my vector. What I want to do is I want to arch some text over this thing, okay? So you have two text features in this software, the first one being in the artwork tab. This text actually brings in the vector format like when we did with that C. It brings in a vector image, which I would convert to, uh, <coughs> which I would convert to rhinestones later. It's also, you can't, you can't arch those, those texts, okay? There's no placement. It's only a baseline uh, placement. But if you want to arch, you'll have to use the hotfix tab, and then here we have hotfix text. And when I click on it, you're going to, just like you handwrite, you will use, you will start from the very, very far left and hit all these points all the way to the right. For instance, I will choose whether I want to use a pre-digitized font, and as you can see, there are 10 different fonts available that come with the software. There are over 27 or 30 fonts that are available that you could purchase at a later date. You also have true type fonts, which use the fonts that are in your Windows library to convert to rhinestones. So just for ease of use, we're going to use uh, digitized fonts, and we'll use the other one too. And I'll choose my font style, and let's go ahead and go with, uh, let's go with uh, Simplex. And then I'll choose the height of my font, which we're going to go uh, about three quarters of an inch. And then we'll choose oops, 0.75. And then we'll choose and we'll enter our text. So we'll go Aaron go bra. Once we hit enter, the text comes into our field. There's a couple things we can do before placement. Number one, look at our spacing between the letters or the spacing between words. That's all controlled by the kerning or the spacing tools right here. If I want my letters to be further apart, I increase this number. Hit yes. If I want to bring my words closer together, I decrease this number. And if you have multiple lines of words, you would increase or decrease this uh, based upon your liking. The next step is actually choosing my bead spacing. And I have a four set here. I'm going to try three and see what it looks like, see if I get better detail. And I do. The next step is actually choosing my, my stone. And you know, there are the two stones. If you want to add a stone that's not already in your bead bar, you can add it right there. The last step I need to do is placement, okay? And that's in the Arrange tab. And as you can see, we have a multitude of different ways we can actually arrange this text on our screen. We're going to choose Upper Arch. And all i got to do is, when I have Upper Arch selected, to see these gray points right here, if I push up with my left mouse button, the text actually uh, arches for me. I can increase the size of the text. I could even grab this gray uh, node over here and squeeze it closer together, further apart. This one over here on the bottom right actually rotates it on the circle that the arch has taken its form. So I'm just going to pop this up just a little bit. I'm actually going to bring my beat, my words a little closer because when you do arch, they do fall, they do go further apart. Let's go to 10. There we go. And I'll just arch it. Get down. Hey, Alan. Um, that yep. looks great. Could you show just like if you wanted to add an individual stone? Yeah, sure. Uh, you can add individual stones anytime you want. Let's see, like we have uh, this A where it didn't really come to a peak. You do have the ability to edit your rhinestones even though they were automatically uh, created. Over here on the sidebar, you have three tools. You have select object, which allows us to select any object on screen and manipulate it. We have our design tool, which allows me to, ch to choose a design that's similar to the hotfix tab up here. And then you have Edit Hotfix. Edit Hotfix allows me to choose one stone in that grouping and then move it. If I want to add a stone, I could right-click when a stone selected and hit Insert Hotfix. And then I could put that stone right there. Cool. You also you have the ability anyway. in the Hotfix tab to do manual Hotfix, and this is just for placing one stone at a time. Great. Okay. All right, so there we go. Now we have our placement. Some of the other different types of uh, uh, shapes that we can do is uh, we have irregular, which allows me to really manipulate this design any way I want. There's not a shape that I cannot go around or go into. Uh, uh, in the Sierra, if I have, if I want to use step text, and of course you grab the bottom right and you step the text down, just like that. 
you have uh, you have banner you have, you, know, you have banners you have uh, just a ton of different types of placements Oop, there we go um, let's see what else I got here the globe the, the, the fish you know you have and there's nothing you can't do uh, outside of the software hey um, um, Alan, I've got you have two lines of Hang yep. on, I've got a question about um, another question about moving the stones and adjusting that. How do you select and move only a few stones from a hotfix image that are grouped together? Well, uh, what you got to do is you got to ungroup the stones. So, like, let's say let's go ahead and set this text, okay? And what I want to do is I want to let's move this over here. What I want to do is actually I want to change a couple of the stones, okay? Maybe I want to do gr uh, black, green, black, green, black, green on my text. A couple things you can do with your text is right click and then split hotfix text and what that does it makes each 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 uh, each text its own object so I'll go ahead and choose the R and then convert it to green just like that cool choose the N convert it to green just click on the color now you can do it you can click on that one hold your control button down and select the next set you can see the stones kind of disappear when they are selected so there's no guesswork there and then choose your color you want them to be that's one way you can do it. Okay, let's go back to where they're all grouped. Okay, if I want to change individual stones, I could explode hotfix objects. Okay, and what that does, it explodes it completely where each stone is its own element. So what I could do is I can hold my control button and select every other stone here. Now at that point, you could also just pick one up and move it if you wanted to, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And see now well, that's what we can do with that's it. That's cool. Okay. And you could do that even in here. But yeah, you could totally ungroup objects by their by uh, individual individual objects or individual stones. Okay. Um, is there any questions at all? Um, there, that's there, pretty much a, a, a pretty, pretty sizable run through of the software and what it can do. I, uh, I think, there, I think we're going to run into a challenge. Some some challenges here, Alan. Um, can you just change one the color of one leaf of that uh, clover? How would you do that? In order, in order to do that, of course, I got to explode this. Okay, I would the right click on here, explode hotfix objects, mm. and then once it once it ungroups it, I will use my uh, mouse to actually select what I want to change. For instance, if I just want, I'm going to do the one leaf. It's it's right now it's exploding it up, so there's a lot of stones yeah, that's in that's a lot of stones to explode. There we go. Okay, so now what I'll do is I'll just start drawing boxes. Making sure I don't get into the text here. All right, and then what I'll do is I'll zoom in. I'll select all these. Once they're all selected, then you can choose whatever color you want it to be. There you go. Okay, so you could you could do red, white, and blue. You could do Irish colors. You know, the orange, uh, yellow, and white, uh, orange, green, and white. Is there like a is there a lasso tool like in uh, like in Photoshop and Illustrator? Not in the hot fix in the embroidery there is. When I go when I go to and explode something up, there is no lasso tool. But you could do in that uh, when it was a vector file. In the yeah, in the in the way I yeah that that would be what the right vector? way to do it. Let's get, yeah, if, if, let's go back to the vectors. Delete those stones. If I want these to be different colors, of course the right way to do it is going to split vector. And in split vector, what I'll do is I'll cut this out. I'll go from one neutral area to another neutral area, and it divides that leaf from the rest. Click on the rest of the green. Click on split vector, and let's go through this one here. From one neutral area to another neutral area, and I can make that red. And you can be as creative as you want. That's or right. if I want to, if I want to do uh, zebra prints, I could do that too. Uh, again, in the split vector, what you can do is just this. Now, what I'm doing is I'm segmenting this design. I'm cutting this design in, in different sections here, and we're just going to do like a lava fill. And then, after you're done with this, uh, somebody would like to see like just how you would send it out to a canvas machine. Yep. Once I do that, I hit enter. Now what I'm going to do is I want the middle color to be orange, and the rest of it's going to be green. So now we have this two, effect, two uh, uh, differential effect. So I'm going to choose all my greens, okay? And I group like colors together. It just makes it easy for the selection. Group, and the yellow is already grouped. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to hotfix, and I'll just go to my B bar, choose a two millimeter, and set the orange. Get rid of this. I right, click on green first, 
Well, we'll click on the yellow first and do the inside color first, convert it to, to rhinestones. And then we'll choose hotfix and we'll choose the green. Click on the green section and convert. Oop, got to turn off hotfix to do it. You turn off hotfix because the rhinestones are on top of my graphic and I can't reach it. And there's our design. Cool. Okay. Got to sweep out our overlaps and we have a finished product. And now, how would you uh, how would you send that out? Well, it's simple. If I have a U, uh, if I have a one v two p machine, there's two there's two different ways I could send it to my cams. I have a direct link to send to my cams machine. You just click on it, choose your machine type. You go to the beads tab here, and you tell it uh, where these beads are, where it's going to be my yellow uh, two millimeters. Tray one indicates the left hopper. If they're actually in tray two, I set tray two. My emerald, I would put in tray one. And then I send it off to the machine. I don't have a machine connected to my uh, computer here, but it, right here it would display my COM port and I would just send it. The other way in a 1v2P is actually exporting as an SRT file to take advantage of the USB port in the front of my machine where you, have a, you can use a USB stick. Under the save file, you would choose export as hotfix stone file. And this will save the SRT file. The same way, you would go to uh, choose your machine type, beads, assign your trays, and then you would save it to a, to a USB stick. On the 1v6p, of course, you would just directly send uh, to your CAMS machine. And if you had a Spangle machine, you can directly send to your Spangle machine using the ASP serial. So, so that's a good question. That, that's going to be my last question. We've got about 10 minutes left in our, uh, in our hour with you right now, Alan. My question is, if you had um, both a... Um, a CAMS machine and the Spangle machine, you wanted to send out the same designs, what kind of changes would you make from one to the other, or would you have to? There would not be any changes except for the COM port will change. Every machine you connect to your computer will have a different communication port, your COM port. And that's always going to be, you'll be able to derive that from your device manager. Uh, if, I go to my, if I go to my control panel, and I go to system and security, and if I go to device manager here, you will have a listing. I don't have it on here because I have no machine connected to my computer. But you will have a common LPT port. And all you got to do is look in that COM port, what COM number it is. The software will, will automatically detect the COM port and tell you what it is. But if and, you wanted to assign it a specific COM port, you can do that in device manager. And, Alan, does the, um, does the Spangle machine have a USB? Yes, it does. It, does, it has a USB uh, slot for a cable. Not a USB port for a USB stick. Okay, so so the Spangle machine you have to direct connect. That's right, and okay. then you would use the send to feature uh, right here to the ASP. So so you could make the same exact design as long as the spacing was good enough for the cams machine. You could take this, you could send it to a cams, and you could send it to a Spangle one right after the other. No worries. Yeah, exactly. Like like what I would do in this design here is. I would actually run the lower stone count in rhinestones and the higher stone count in spangles since the spangle machine is a lot faster and actually get a lot better product uh, in appearance as well as cost uh, if for those that are actually doing mixed media if you're doing rhinestones and spangle together. Okay. Yep. Okay. What other questions do we have out there? Um, there's one that says, can the software complete a price for my client? No, 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 it, it doesn't do pricing nope. options because um, the pricing varies from state to state. What I would get in Florida would be vastly different from what you're going to get in Texas. You'll get a higher dollar amount since the perceived value in Texas uh, is, more, is, is, a lot, is a lot stronger than here in Florida or even up in New York. So, yeah, um, Steve, Stephen, I, I, I always recommend a market-based pricing. I know, like, especially if you're an embroiderer, you might be used to charging by the stitch. Um, what I do is take a look at the design and the, and the time it takes and how it looks. Look at the, your market and see how much you can possibly charge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they, you have, There are some apps that you can put, download that actually will keep track based upon what you pay for stones and, with the, and you just enter the quantity in there. It's like an Excel document and then it will actually calculate what your, uh, what your expenditures right. are. Right, because remember it will always show you what the stone count is. Yeah, now, right down actually, here we can um, see what, Ashley has like a, has a question, and I want to answer answer part of this, Alan. She asked, "What the um, what are the minimum requirements?" And actually, the the one thing I'll, I'll tell you right off the bat is 
is you should never go with the minimum requirements. You should also always go with the maximum that you can afford. Uh, Absolutely. Within your budget, you want, you want a computer that's going to last you for, uh, at least five, seven years before it becomes obsolete because you are going to add software and images and files. And the more files you save and the more applications you download or software you install, you're using more and more system resources to drive it. So if you, have, if you go double the, the, the resource recommendations, that computer should last you five to seven years before it becomes obsolete. Right. The, the sentence that I've never heard is, I have too much RAM, my computer is too fast, I have too much hard drive space. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. The, the last question here is, uh, is Dena, will the CAMs accept YNG files? Yes, it will. Oh, yeah, it will, but um, <laughs> that's a, great, that's a great, great question. I think that's a feature you can do in Sierra, too. A lot of people that when they were first starting off with rhinestones were using um, uh, easier software to use, like, C like the Gem Master software, which creates a YNG file. You can actually import all your YNG files into Sierra with the optional add-on of the import YNG file. Right. For instance, when I first started working here, I created nothing but YNG files. Now, if I want to actually bring them into Sierra, I could actually go to my desktop. And I would go to my Gem Master files, and they're somewhere on here. But but it is it is an optional add-on. Absolutely. And then basically, I'll just go California Girl here. Right now, what it's doing is interpreting my Gem Master file and converting it to a format that Sierra understands precisely. It's very simple. Watch this is this will just blow you away. All right. So after it finishes reading it, it's actually going to interpret it and put it in my screen. There it is. Now it's showing me the colors that it sees. Okay, so all I got to do is actually go to um, uh, create B palette and it adds the stones that I need right to it. I hit OK, and there's my YNG file. That's great. And and Alan, would they contact support or sales for that conversion component? Uh, sales. Okay. Sales. You can actually. It's an add-on. With uh, it's an it's an add-on feature you can get for YNG. For those uh, customers out there, the, the clients out there, they're actually doing brush and break. They have PLT files. There's also an import PLT function that works the same way. So all those PLT files that you created for your brush and break bake can be easily imported into Sierra software as well. Yeah, that's great. Okay, um, guys, it is about five o'clock, and um, we have taken Alan away from actually. Um, answering support calls in order to do this little extra training. So we're going to make him get back to it right now. I do have a, um, a recording, um, I hope it came out well, of this presentation. And, um, and we'll get it out to each and every one of you. I'll send you a link shortly. Alan, is there anything else you'd like to wrap up with? Uh, no, no, that's, that's, uh, that's it. Okay, thanks a lot, man. I appreciate the help. And we look forward to, uh, to talking to you guys soon about our next uh, training presentation. All right.